So, you think I'm going to tell you about the ghost of Korra? But I wouldn't. This is our country's 59th year of independence. And someone has written for me a wonderful little story that I think you should enjoy. It's entitled, Coffee, Mr. Policeman. So I'll read you. Inspector Joshua smiled at his image in the long bedroom mirror. Standing at full height, 5'7", 150 pounds, this evening he felt like 10 feet tall. He adjusted his brown tie, worn over a stiff white shirt, pulled tighter on his shining brown belt, exhaled deeply, and looked approvingly at his size 9 shoes. Make sure no one steps on either of you at the Hilton, he commanded the pair, bending to remove a grey strand of curly hair that landed mockingly on his right clocks. Rosie, his wife, had entered the room, his officer's hat in her left hand, while her right hand massaged the head. Rosie, man, careful, please. I tire tell you to cover your head when I'm dressing for special police business. Last time your hair grease got on my shirt, and it was a good thing I hadn't put on my jacket yet. Rosie rolled her eyes. She handed him his wallet. But what you need wallet for, eh, Josh? And the police association paying the dinner bill? Rosie, you ever know me to leave home without my wallet? Oh, there's trouble, you know. Car break down, wreck I have to be paid. You never know. Joshua, you are a very exasperating man, she said. One of these days, I will personally lock you up in a cell with all your fancy uniforms and medals and throw away the key. Don't talk so now, girl, Inspector Joshua pleaded. You know how I love you, but I'm real particular about the public image. We image, Rosie responded, her hair askance, brown eyes open wide, ready to pop out. Where I come into this? This is the third police dinner for the year, and I ain't been invited to one. Like somebody feel because I pushing a big size, I will eat all the place. Sweetheart, Inspector Joshua replied, nobody could say that, especially to my face. Everybody know I love my woman, my big beautiful woman. Rosie blushed and Inspector Joshua explained. I don't make the rules. Besides, at this dinner, it's, a, it's big man talk. Talk for big man's ears only. Top secret thing even the average wife or husband shouldn't hear. And when you talk in big man business, where the female officers does be? Whispering in your sweet little ears? Listen, the commissioner will soon hear from me. Something wrong with this arrangement. Rosie quarreled. Inspector Joshua didn't answer. He was afraid that anything he said, even in jest, might be taken down and used against him later, especially in a divorce court. He chuckled at his wisdom. She gently placed the hat on the bed, turned and looked her husband over from head to shoe tip. She smiled and fondly patted him on the shoulder. He was very dear to her. Your hands clean, Rosie, he asked. Heavens, Josh, she blurted out, stamping her foot. He is one ridiculous policeman. Rosie, Inspector Joshua cried, Look how you mash my shoe. Inspector Joshua stopped his Datsun 280C at the solid wrought iron gate, painted blood red. Inspector Harry Lyle waved from the side porch, turned and nodded curtly to a slim woman standing in the doorway. He walked stiffly to the Datsun. Not even a kiss or embrace for the poor wifey, Inspector Joshua silently lamented. He recalled Mahatma Gandhi writing in his biography that Hindu women were excessively subservient to their husbands. He wondered how Rosie would have fared married to a Hindu officer. How things, Harry? he asked. The wifey happy to stay home? You know me, Josh. I arranged things down to the last item. I called Shanti's mother off over for the weekend. I put in a big order for Bafi, Polori, Sahina, Bossop Shot, and Curry Duck going to take their minds off me tonight. They were silent for a while. Then Harial asked, and Rosie? The Datton hit a pothole on the highway just past Fernandez compound, rattling Inspector Joshua's thoughts. He composed himself. On the shoulder of the eastbound lane, an old black Mercedes Benz was parked, its bonnet open. Several persons had gathered around the car. Road assistant, 
or robbery in progress. In the distance, he spotted revolving blue lights racing to the bends. Drive, urge Harry Lal. Our boys will handle things. Now, tell me about Rosie. Inspector Joshua squinted as the sinking sun generously spread gold across the western sky. He answered dully. She fussed a bit. Nothing to speak about. You know how women feel when left out. Joshua was sure Harry Lal understood. Joshua and Harry Lal had joined the police service in their teens and rose in rank neck and neck, commanding stations throughout the country, building the reputation of no-nonsense men. They were friends to the innocent, but enemies to the guilty. And they knew who was guilty before a jury was picked. The Datsun headed up Charlotte Street and Harry Lal asked, You think Spanish ready by now? Inspector Joshua replied, He better be. I don't like to hang around too long in, in Belmont. Too many foolish youths playing hot shot these days. And this is not an evening for blood spilling. It's an evening for ham, turkey, garlic pork, Mexican rice. Bus up shot. Dal puri. Even a little pale hour on the side. Whiskey, rum and cola and brandy. And a tall cup of coffee. Spanish was liberally splashing on Cologne when he heard the Daxon's horn. She come in, he come in, Sheila, his wife, shouted through the kitchen window. She met Spanish at the front door, pressed a neatly folded handkerchief into his hand and tipped her to kiss him on the cheek. Behave yourself wisely, Pedro Ramirez. Sheila cautioned, you know how you can't handle strong drinks. Don't worry, honey. The Spanish is the Spanish you're talking to, he said. Wait now, said Harry Lal to Ramirez as the Datsun cut across Oxford Street and up Charlotte Street. Like you swallowed the cologne bottle? Like you out for action this evening? Sheila must be thinking the same thing. You should have seen how she eyed me while I was dressing for this dinner, replied Ramirez. I was sorry to leave her at home, but a man needs a break every now and then. Not so? Neither Joshua nor Harry Lal answered. The Hilton Ballroom was loaded with red, white, and black balloons. Smartly attired policemen and women, animated chatter, hors d'oeuvres, whiskey, rum, wine, sparkling water. Glasses were, they covered the table in golden trays. Cigar smoke will soon fill the air as the Cuban brand lay boxfuls on a wide side table. Inspectors Joshua Harilal and Ramirez rubbed their hands in anticipation of a grand evening. Waiters and waitresses dressed in white and hoisting cram trays moved expertly and cheerfully among the guests who were there for the next four hours to be served and not to be protected. Inspector Joshua noticed that several officers stood solemnly apart with their wives, sipping mild drinks and chatted, chatting guardedly. Junior ranks, muttered Joshua. Junior ranks. He turned and faced a well-rounded waitress with a whiskey tray. She smiled, exposing brilliant white teeth. Her chocolate complexion and dimpled cheeks made his heart skip a beat. He reached for a glass and she moved on. He regretted not complimenting her attributes, but consoled himself that the day was still young. He didn't particularly like a heavy wig but thought her wide-rimmed glasses were becoming. He wondered at the color of her eyes. He thought of Rosie. Harilal and Ramirez were swooshing whiskey on the rocks when the commissioner declared the evening formally open, the national anthem to follow, and the buffet line ready for action. He was extremely happy to welcome the soulmates of his officers. The pigeon peas steeped in coconut sauce was Harry Lal's favorite, made more exotic by the slender Indian woman who served with a charming expression. Her eyes, even in the dim lighting, carried a brilliant sparkle. He was glad that his chair faced the buffet table. He couldn't keep his eyes off her. He thought of Shanti and wondered how she and her mother were getting on. Ramirez was happy to be alive he chatted freely with the unmarried female officers at the table, recounting gallant encounters with rough characters in distant outstations. 
he felt important. She would have, Sheila would have approved, he thought. Dessert was a real treat. Creme caramel, strawberry cheesecake, pineapple upside down, black forest special, and coconut ice cream. Then the offer of coffee or tea. Inspector Joshua chose coffee, but insisted that the boiled water, milk, and sugar be brought to his table. Nah, man, Joshua, you're giving trouble, said two attractive female officers at his table. These waitresses must be tired. No trouble at all, said the well-rounded waitress with the white rimmed glasses. Anything to please the gentleman. She moved to the table at the eastern corner of the room and returned with the items. Yes, sir, said Inspector Joshua. Nobody but me can make a cup of coffee for me. The waitresses stood calmly, observing Inspector Joshua's movements. Others seated at his table were amused at his delicate thoroughness. Inspector Joshua raised the cup to his nose, sniffed at the pleasant steaming aroma, and was about to have a sip when a waiter approached and summoned Inspector Joshua to a phone call in the lobby. Inspector Joshua covered his cup with a saucer, excused himself, and headed to the lobby. Quick, said Officer Wendy to the well-rounded waitress. Let's show him woman his boss. When Inspector Joshua returned to his seat, all appeared intact. He lifted the saucer, sniffed the contents again, and swallowed slowly. He smiled contentedly, giving his coffee the thumbs up. He didn't know the waitress had replaced his brew with hers. His table companions clapped heartily, but said nothing. Sega smoke swirled upwards, annoying some women chatting in tight groups, as sherry glasses were emptied and refilled. Harilal was drawn to the slender Indian waitress who moved effortlessly, replenishing cigar boxes. Her hair was streaked in red and yellow. She wore small rose-shaped earrings. There was something mystical about her. He wanted desperately to speak to her. Ramirez, meanwhile, was man of the moment, dramatically recalling a city drug bust with a former machine gun toting commissioner. His eyes fell on a dark-skinned, curly-headed female standing at a corner lectern, shuffling leaflets, and he forgot about drugs and machine guns. He sauntered over to the lectern and began chatting casually. She was polite, but seemed indifferent. He wasn't bothered. He trusted his charm. Conquest was inevitable. At the head table, Commissioner Hedley clapped for silence. He rose stately as the room quieted. He was no smoker but his left hand cradled an unlighted cigar. He said, Ladies and gentlemen, fellow officers of every rank, it has been an exceedingly wonderful evening. For a few hours, we have laid aside the drama and trauma our country has faced in recent times. For a few hours, we have surmounted the prejudices of race, the differences of religion, the extenuating pressure of economic hardships, local and international. The police association has more than its fair share of irregularities, but we have come a long way, and we are going further still. Loud thumping on tables. Commissioner Headley pulled on his unlit cigar. He continued, the Prime Minister and the Minister of National Security, who are unable to be here with us, have expressed their deepest gratitude for your still in service to your beloved country, our beloved country and wish you continued success in your efforts to serve with impunity. Low thumping. Commissioner Headley mentioned dramatic arrests in kidnap cases, decrease in car thefts, reduction in gang wars, and vanishing white-collar crimes. Low thumping. Even now, he said, while we are snug at the Hilton, our colleagues are out there battling to bring law and order to the land. Let us raise a toast to our dedicated comrades. All in the hall, in the room, sorry, rose as one. Now said Commissioner Henley when his officers and their guests had settled in their seats. For the surprise of the evening, will inspectors Joshua, Harilal, and Ramirez please step forward? The baffled trio clumsily approached the head table. At ease, gentlemen, said the Commissioner. This is not an inquisition, rather, for your exemplary police work, the association has decided to reward you with a night at the Hilton. All expenses paid. It is regrettable, though, 
that you did not escort your wives to this function. We are sure they would have been elated. We feel this is one case you have goofed. 